In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This autumn, I continue to be keenly aware of empty chairs. How many of you have noticed it in your own lives? Your daughter goes off to college to leave an empty seat at the breakfast nook. Your mother now resides in a nursing facility. And with death, the empty spots become more pronounced. So a widower continues to prepare a place setting for his deceased wife. A colleague who once sat next to you at faculty meetings is no longer there because of cancer. A schoolmate dies in a car accident and no longer sits in the end chair at the blue table in the school cafeteria. Empty chairs, empty hearts, empty places around the communion table. Yes, they are painful reminders of the temporary span of earthly life. Empty chairs point to the caverns in our hearts left by those of faith who have died. Within this context of incompleteness, grief, and loss, we hear hearty words from the prophet Isaiah this morning. Words that constitute our hope in God's promised future without discounting human pain and separation. This is a vision filled with captivating scenery. The sacred mountain now no longer inspires terror, but welcomes all people to a picnic. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food without any need to take crestor or insulin. This will be a feast of victory with premium wines and meats, sweetest cuts closest to the bone. Yes, well-aged wine strained clear with low sulfites that make digestion work like a charm. And during this banquet, God will obliterate the shroud that is cast over all peoples and between nations. God will also dismantle landmines that set apart hostile nations and the landmines of hateful hearts that stir up external conflict in the first place. And God will swallow up death forever. Get this. There will be no more empty chairs. There will be no more jockeying for the best seats. There will be no separation between those who serve from footstools and those who lord themselves from easy chairs. The Lord God of compassion will wipe away the tears from all swollen faces. The God of mercy will overcome our disgrace with holy grace. And the word of this promised future will not return empty. Beloved, this is our God for whom we wait on this All Saints Sunday. This is our God from whom we already receive today a foretaste, a glimpse of the feast to come. We already rejoice and give thanks on this All Saints celebration that division and death are not the final act. And the empty chair and the war zone will never be the lasting scenes of existence. How then do we live out this hope of God's promised future that impacts our here and now? How then do we live out our resurrection hope in Jesus Christ? Some folks pull back radically from life in this world in anticipation of God's future. 
Other folks will misconstrue the freedom found in this gospel hope and get swallowed up in the pleasures, cares, and issues of, of this world to the point where they overestimate the mark they can actually leave. But our continual yearning forward to the world to come, heaven, and a new Jerusalem is neither a form of escapism nor wishful thinking. C.S. Lewis, the author, once wrote on this subject, If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is precisely out of our deep and penetrating immersion into the promised future of God that we live out our present lives with abiding hope. It is our prayer that the Holy Spirit will so fill our hearts with the vision of God's incredible feast that we invite as many as we can to the table in this sanctuary. For we are called to bring others to the table as we are filled with the hope of God's promised banquet table where neither chairs nor hearts nor stomachs are left empty. 24 years ago, I was helping my parents make the move into their retirement home outside of Hickory, North Carolina. They moved from Greensboro to Hickory, North Carolina. During one of my precious days with them, my mother and I were out in the garage working and sorting through stuff when we stopped for a coat break. At that moment, my mother pointed over to a little wooden chair positioned next to me. Do you know who made that child's chair? She asked. Before I could respond, she continued, Oliver Metz made that chair for my daddy to give to me as a young girl as a measure of thanks for getting him some odd jobs. You see, Oliver Metz lived in a shack out in the piney woods by himself. He was a biracial man who was born from an affair between a prominent white man in the community and a poorly educated black girl. Oliver was the one in Ballantyne, South Carolina, who could never be seen in public for too long in 1954. He never landed a permanent job. He fit into neither the black nor the white community. My grandfather, Herbert Leroy Amick, a poor carpenter himself, always pulled up a chair for Oliver when he came by conveniently around dinner time. Oliver became a member of the family. He played with my mother and her older sister, who were teenagers at the time, like a bachelor uncle. A carpenter himself, Oliver made furniture for my grandfather in exchange for a little love and belonging. He loved my grandmother Ollie's chicken pie and homemade bread. He belonged at that crowded kitchen table in the little white frame house by the railroad tracks. Well, in 1954, Oliver Metz died suddenly in his early 40s, and the local Lutheran pastor was too afraid to conduct a public funeral for Oliver at Bethel Church, the church where Oliver was baptized in secret, the home church of my mom and her parents. But my grandfather persisted with the pastor that his friend, Oliver Metz would have a proper Christian funeral in that church. Few people attended that funeral in 1954 
but my mother tells of singing in the choir, dressed in her Sunday best, strict orders from her father. Now, my maternal grandparents were not perfect people. They had many quirks, hardships, faults, prejudices, and insecurities. But they were grasped by the banquet vision of a gracious and hospitable God which gave meaning and mission to their earthly lives. My grandparents were so thoroughly rooted in the heavenly vision that they risked their reputation to invite Oliver Metz to a humble banquet table in their crowded kitchen. Their empty chairs, I will grieve until I meet them again. As we celebrate All Saints today, we participate in a hope for the feast to come where God will make sure that neither seat nor stomach is left empty. And we keep on keeping on thoroughly immersed in this vision to invite folks to the empty places around the communion rail in this church, to the empty places in our homes, and to the open places at work and school. For this is our God, the one who makes for all peoples a feast of rich food. This is our God who destroys divisions, who will swallow up death forever and wipe away the tears from our faces. We can even pull up a chair and put our life and reputation on the line for our neighbor, not to gain heaven, but precisely because heaven is already a given in our crucified and risen Lord. At his feast and around our other daily feasts, we receive a foretaste of heaven and his companionship for our journey. 